Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be upon you all. Hello, good evening, good afternoon, or morning, depending on where you are. So thank you very much for the fine introduction, uh, Professor Amele Ukwe. Uh, I'd like to take this first opportunity to thank the um, organizers for inviting me to this fabulous event and prestigious event, uh, namely Professor Amele and Lydia Stotskopsi uh, from the Globe Ethics Academic Affairs Division. I'm proud to say that I've been collaborating with Globe Ethics for uh, quite some time now, and I, I would like to continue to collaborate in the many more years to come, inshallah. So my name is Dikis Sofjan from the Indonesian Consortium for Religious Studies. So it's a consortium of three universities comprising Gajamada University, the non-confessional university, the Christian university, and the um, uh, Islamic university of Sunan Kalijogo, all based in Yogyakarta. And so I've been tasked to sort of uh, share my uh, thoughts and insights on religious and ethnic diversity and how we uh, in higher education in Indonesia can play a role in that. Uh, and I believe that coming from a multicultural and multi-religious uh, country like Indonesia, this theme definitely uh, suits me perfectly. But I would also like to mention that given the contemporary context in the world we live in right now, that this topic is obviously of great relevance to many countries of the world. Yeah, so... So I would like to structure my presentation in, in just sort of giving an overview in terms of Indonesia's uh, mega diversity. Yeah, uh, because as you all probably know that Indonesia is a huge country with three time zones uh, located in Southeast Asia. Um, the second part, I will talk more about the sort of political uh, context in which uh, we are currently living in after more than 20 years of uh, reform, uh, which occurred in 97-98, which dethroned uh, the new order regime. And then I will proceed to talk about how agama or religion and the management of diversity uh, is, is being held up in the country by uh, the state and society. And then I'll talk a little bit and touch upon uh, how Indonesian Islam plays a role in sort of moderating uh, the uh, dynamics uh, among the religious communities throughout Indonesia. I would also like here to invite uh, this new concept, relatively new concept, and, and that is knowledge brokering how we uh, as academics and intellectuals could actually help in mediating uh, some of the discourses and the various uh, forms and systems of knowledge, available knowledge out there to help bring uh, you know, the society to uh, a better um, condition. And then lastly, I will uh, talk about the ethical considerations and implications of how religious diversity is being managed in Indonesia and how intellectuals, academics, and those engaging in higher education could uh, take up a proactive role in it. So first of all, I just like to say that Indonesia comprises 17,000 islands yeah, with wide range of floral and faunal uh, species. Uh, and this was um, very much highlighted by a very classic book by Alfred Russell Wallace uh, in the 19th century uh, called the Malay Archipelago, which he talks vividly about the orangutans, the birds of paradise, and all kinds of uh, species uh, in various parts of Indonesia, especially in the island of Sulawesi, where his name then was uh, attributed uh, to that. But then we also have a rich uh, seascapes and marine life. And what this translates into is that um, my argument is to say that the, the social cultural diversity and the religious diversity in Indonesia also mirrors that uh, diversity that we see 
in the ecological settings of the archipelago, we have around 700 psycholinguistic groups. Yeah, so around 500 languages and 700 uh, dialects across uh, the country. We have different food and culinary art forms in, in various provinces and districts. We have uh, over 500 districts uh, in uh, Indonesia and, and uh, 34 provinces. We have different ethnic dresses, traditional costumes. We have various uh, kinds of batik fabrics. I'm wearing uh, one specific um, batik uh, fabric right now. And then, of course, uh, like all uh, and many Southeast Asian nations, we are also into you know songs and dances, which you could uh, view uh, for each of the uh, provinces and regions of the country. Now, uh, religiously speaking, in terms of demographics, um, Islam is the predominant uh, religion, and when I say Islam here, it is Sunni Islam. Uh, with the predominance of the Shafi'i juridical uh, school. So within the Sunni Islam, uh, you have four major imams uh, who had uh, what we call mazhabs or juridical schools. Yeah? Um, but then apart from Islam, we also have um, other religions, notably world religions. Um, of course, we have Catholicism, we have Protestantism, we have Hinduism, Buddhism, and in Indonesia, Confucianism is, uh, is under the category of religion. So essentially, these are the six mainstream uh, world religions that are um, sort of recognized and uh, serviced by the state, namely by the Ministry of Religious Affairs, which I will talk more about later on. But then apart from these world religions, there are also um, other world religions, so to speak. So you have Sheikhs, you have Baha'is, you have Shintos and, and others. But in addition to all of those religions, you also have uh, around 400, possibly around 400 so-called local religions or indigenous spiritual beliefs uh, spread across the archipelago. You know, having the different uh, worldviews, rituals, uh, festivities, and so on and so forth. Um, this is the um, sort of, a, a picture of that tells you how religion is important in Indonesia. So if you look at the uh, uh, the chart, this is the national budget allocation for ministries and state agencies uh, in Indonesia. As you can see, the Ministry of Religious Affairs uh, comes forth with a budget of uh, 65.1 trillion. And so that's uh, around 4.5 billion US dollars per year. So you can just imagine the, uh, the, you know, the power of this ministry and the extent to which uh, they can reach the country because they have uh, branches and sub branches in uh, virtually all of the districts and sub-districts of uh, Indonesia. Now, in looking at diversity, um, religion comes under the purview of the Ministry of Religious Affairs. And uh, within this ministry, um, lately since uh, 2016, when President Joko Widodo came to power, that um, he wanted to promote um, a moderate form of uh, religiosity, what we call moderasi beragama. Uh, we don't quite know yet how to translate this, uh, this term, but some have used moderate religiosity, some have used religious moderation. But obviously, um, some people might have some reservations regarding the term moderation, because when it comes to religion, and spirituality, there's always that passion and enthusiasm and the spirit that uh, oftentimes um, overcome, uh, you know, an individual or group. Yeah? Um, but if you look at the current state of the Ministry of Religious Affairs, you can see well-educated and well-meaning civil servants uh, who are working tirelessly to monitor 
uh, the various religious groups, um, including some of the more recent, uh, you know, sort of new religious movements. Yeah, uh, we have had a lot of uh, recent NRMs, what we call NRMs, uh, new religious movements, popping up uh, in various uh, regions of Indonesia. Now, uh, my institution, ICRS, has been working with the ministry uh, since um, 2013, and we have a memorandum of understanding to work on various um, uh, issues, uh, namely on uh, managing religious diversity and um, on, um, you know, uh, joint conferences um, and uh, publications and talks and uh, training and so on and so forth. But the latest program, the big program that we had was a program called Religious Literacy, uh, which we uh, intended to sort of train and enhance the awareness of the religious extension offices. You know, within uh, the Minister of Religious Affairs, uh, they have what's called religious extension offices or religious counselors, which are spread across the country. And they number around 115,000. So you can just imagine the extent of their arm. And so this religious literacy was essentially to promote tolerance uh, social justice and multiculturalism. Uh, and so we have a module on religious literacy for the religious extension officers as well as for the trainers. And so we had over the course of three years um, trained uh, almost close to 1000 religious extension officers, researchers and uh, trainers. These are just some of the uh, activities and the product uh, in which the religious literacy had uh, produced during the course of the time. Um, now, Indonesia has been known for uh, many decades, if not at least a century, for the sort of the smiley form of Islam. Yeah, um, and we are known to have a different kind of Islam from that of the Middle East, so to speak. But then this image uh, of the smiley Islam has recently been sort of um, undermined by the various uh, exploits of some of the uh, extremist Muslims and radicalists and terrorists. Just within this month, we have had two suicide attacks, one on the Catholic church on the cathedral in South Sulawesi and one uh, which was a suicidal attack by um, a woman uh, with air soft gun uh, who attacked the um, headquarters of the national police in the capital city of Jakarta. And of course, there have been some, um, you know, uh, uh, support from some of the Muslim groups in Indonesia uh, toward um, extremist um, groups outside of Indonesia, such as uh, ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and others. But the uh, idea about Indonesian Islam is this debate about whether the Islam uh, that we have here is Islam in Indonesia or of Indonesia. Yeah? So whether to say that the Islam in Indonesia is, is just a, a sort of a transportation or importation of Islam from the Middle East in Indonesia, or does the Indonesian culture have um, a say or is influencing um, uh, the religion? Of course, there has been lately um, a great influence of uh, some transnational uh, movements coming in from outside of Indonesia to influence the discourse and the practice of uh, Islam in Indonesia. But essentially, when we talk about Indonesian Islam, it's really about the fusion uh, of religion and, and, and culture, so Islam and the Indonesian um, cultural dimensions. Uh, and this um, sort of is uh, sort of embedded in this whole um, uh, discourse on the indigenization of Islam versus the Arabization of Islam. And so there is this uh, tug of war between those who like to still maintain the uh, sort of cultural ties with uh, um, Indonesia and those 
who are more sort of uh, affiliated to the uh, Middle Eastern form of uh, Islam, or more specifically the Arabicized form of Islam. But um, for the past uh, 20 years or so, there has been this sort of um, uh, debate as well and deliberation about the compatibility of Islam and democracy. I remember attending the first uh, Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy in Washington, D.C. at Georgetown University, where I um, talked about the idea between, the you know, the compatibility between Islam and democracy. And one could argue that, um, that there are many principles within um, Islam that could be compatible with, uh, with the, you know, democratic uh, practice. These are just some of the uh, major Islamic groups. We have the Muhammadiyah, uh, which was established in 1912, uh, which is a sort of a modernist organization. It has a wide network of schools from early childhood, kindergarten, primary, secondary, high school, and including universities across the um, country. The Nahdlatul Ulama is a more traditional um, organization established in 1926, um, which has produced a lot of ulama, clerics, uh, who are well versed in the classical sciences of Islam and have, um, you know, around maybe 20,000 or so Islamic traditional boarding schools across um, Indonesia. The latest one is the Majlis Ulama Indonesia or the Indonesian Council of Ulama, which have been quite problematic in recent uh, years because uh, they have been one of the uh, groups that have been considered as a contributor to this conservative turn in uh, Indonesia. In 2005, they issued a fatwa to uh, make um, pluralism, liberalism, and secularism as impermissible uh, uh, for Muslims. And I can talk to you and elaborate more on that if, uh, if you're interested in the question and answer. But my um, main message here is that um, as academics and intellectuals uh, positioned in higher education, uh, we need to think how we could sort of uh, promote religious diversity and how to um, have uh, that as sort of um, a common denominator um, for um, our society. Um, and I think uh, knowledge brokering is one um, sort of thing which we could uh, consider as a strategy. Because uh, the way I see it, based on my own sort of observation and um, uh, uh, analysis, is that oftentimes that when you talk about religion, there's a lot of misunderstanding. Yeah? So non-religious people don't understand religion and religious people don't understand the secular people. And then the religious communities can't really understand uh, uh, the politicians or the bureaucrats in government and vice versa and so on and so forth. So I think uh, we as intellectuals and academics uh, in higher education, I think have a role to play in terms of uh, mediating uh, some of these uh, discussions and deliberations that are oftentimes, um, you know, um, causing a lot of uh, misunderstanding. Uh, so the idea of knowledge brokering is also linking sort of scientific, academic work and strategic knowledge. Yeah, oftentimes, um, we are too um, fixated and embroiled in our own thinking about theories and, you know, scientific research without uh, necessarily sort of thinking strategically how some of these ideas could be implemented on the ground. So I think we need to also be involved and uh, try as much as possible to promote uh, knowledge exchanges, uh, because I think in, uh, in knowledge exchanges, uh, we can oftentimes play around with uh, new discursive tools, yeah? like the way uh, we had infuse, for instance, the idea of religious literacy within the Ministry of Religious Affairs. You know, I mean, uh, for many people in Indonesia, that is obviously um, counterintuitive. 
because you would think that religious people don't need religious literacy anymore, you know. Um, but then, um, obviously, I could prove them wrong, and I can elaborate more on that. The other thing that, uh, based on our experience, is that we have played a role uh, to develop the capacity of, of research for the uh, civil servants, for uh, many of the bureaucrats, so that they can develop their own set of thinking and analysis about how to engage religious communities um, in a very uh, fruitful manner. And also the building of linkages and networks between and among the civil society organizations, the religious communities and faith leaders, together with, uh, you know, the government people, the policymakers, the bureaucrats and so on. And so the idea of co-designing evidence-based policies, I think, uh, play a role here. You know, we, we can play um, a, a definite role here uh, and a fruitful one as well. In terms of, uh, and this is my last um, slide, ethical implications. In many countries, when it comes to religious diversity of any kind or diversity of any kind, you tend to find that there is this logic of majoritarianism, which behind that is really uh, hiding the politics of domination. And I think uh, all human beings are by nature, in their fitrah, in, in the Islamic uh, lingo, in their fitrah is against any form of uh, domination. So I think when we, uh, uh, you know, engage on issues of diversity, we need to be fully aware of where we stand. I think when it comes to the politics of domination, because oftentimes the logic of majoritarianism uh, is at play. Yeah, and oftentimes groups are labeled as minorities. Uh, uh, while in fact uh, that labeling uh, has a lot of negative implications. I often um, argue, uh, including in my um, articles, that oftentimes this majority minority um, bifurcation uh, is not at all uh, meaningful or useful. And then this idea that uh, we need to fight for social justice and, and we need to uh, apply this to all uh, the groups uh, in society without any uh, discrimination, without any uh, sort of preference for our own sort of um, faith communities. And in doing so, as an academic, um, I like to promote action research because action research, I think, has greater implications um, for society. Uh, because it really, um, it's hard on, on, on how uh, we can resolve some of these issues. But uh, with action research, we need to be more open and adaptable to the various uh, systems of knowledge uh, that are out there. Oftentimes, we in academia tend to sort of um, take scientific research or scientific uh, uh, knowledge and theories as being uh, the most important uh, system of knowledge, while in fact, uh, in other contexts, uh, you know, other systems of knowledge are equally quite um, important. Avoiding the Trojan horse effect. In many of the discussions about uh, democracy and, and civil society, there's been a lot of talk about how civil society in many, um, especially developing countries, have become Trojan horses. Yeah. They have come in to bring in uh, outside foreign ideas to the country to essentially um, sort of destabilized and weaken uh, the state and society. So I think um, for us and for those who are dealing with um, uh, ethnic and religious uh, diversity that we need to be fully aware of, of this game and not to be sort of, um, you know, uh, be uh, in any way affected by this uh, strategy from um, the external forces. So with that, I'd like to end my presentation and thank you for your kind uh, attention.